Welcome everyone to the Brooklyn Book Festival. Tonight is the seventh day of a eight day festival where we have presented over a hundred programs and almost 300 authors. It has been um, a tremendous week of literary celebration and we're very grateful to have Isabel Wilkerson and Michael Eric Dyson with us tonight. Um, I would like to say one thing, show the love by purchasing their books in the link below. Uh, they are authors with books after all. And um, I'm going to turn it over now uh, to both of them to continue the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very kindly. Um, I'm honored to be here today with a woman who is among the three or four greatest writers in America, arguably the finest writer in America today. I'm going to make that argument. So um, it is a, a, an extraordinary honor uh, to be with you, Miss Isabel Wilkerson and uh, to have this opportunity to chat with you. They're calling it a conversation, but I'm just gonna fanboy out. And uh, <clears throat> as they say in the hood, ask you <laughs> some questions and uh, see if we can stimulate a conversation. Um, a remarkable book to be certain. And I wanna begin um, with a kind of conceptual uh, inquiry, if you will. So in the warmth of other suns, you take the massive movement and mobilization of Black people from the South out, a kind of intra, uh, you know, <clears throat> American diaspora, if you will, and the way in which Black people find out. My mama's from Alabama, my daddy from Georgia. I lived in <laughs> Chicago, they ain't nothing but a suburb of Mississippi, exactly. as you make so brilliantly apparent. Uh, the Negroes in, you know, Louisiana uh, went over to, to California uh, and from Texas over to Los Angeles. That's why Snoop Dogg talked, falling back on that ass with the hellified gangster lean, right? So we can see the imprint of the great migration in the tonal patterns and the verbal uh, ticks and the rhetorical habits of black people. But you imagined in that book, the mass mobilization and migration um, both the push and pull of those instances where black people fanned out, right? And it seems that in this book, you have taken it a step or two back, right? So that what lies behind that great migration, the warmth of other suns, <clears throat> a magisterial tome that I would recommend all of you uh, get your hands on as soon as you can and read it uh, post haste. But in that book, you imagine uh, against the canvas of American possibility, political and economic and social um, uh, factors, what it meant for black people to exist. But here, you kind of backstop it. You go back and say, well, let me, let me go way back. Uh, let me go back to the beginning, right? On the extract, the extraction of uh, African souls uh, from their resting place on their native soil brought here uh, and the mass migration of black people on the middle passage, but then getting here, uh, in North America, now you've taken on something even larger, the notion of caste. So I just want people to understand this is a conceptual acuity and a philosophical argument that we don't want to don't want to miss because some people have talked about race and ethnicity and caste and you know class and the like. Tell us philosophically and conceptually why it is that you wanted to cast. <laughs> pun intended, pun intended. <laughs> Cast your, your, your sight across the intellectual horizon and give for us a, a kind of philosophical depth to a notion that for some people uh, is, is rather interesting and, and, and you know, offers a kind of purchase that initially they think, well, but then when you read the book, you go, my God, how ingenious. So help us understand how you grasped hold of the notion of caste. So first, let me say, I'm honored to be here with you. And I can tell already, we're gonna have an interesting time <laughs> and a good time, I think, I hope. <laughs> so let me start with that. Oh, very <laughs> Thank good. you. <laughs> so so it, it really goes back to the warmth of the suns because in that book, 
I had to look at what it was like to live in the Jim Crow South. What did that really mean? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we all get exposed to the imagery of the black and white uh, water fountains, the color only restrooms, white only restrooms. So we all know about that. But in doing the research for that book and talking to uh, the hundreds of hundreds, actually 1200 people that I uh, talked to uh, in order to narrow it down to the three people who I would tell the story of, I came to realize that uh, a lot of the language that we're used to using did not really fully uh, encompass all that they were dealing with. They were living in a world in, when, in which it was against the law for a black person and a white person to merely play checkers in Birmingham, the state where your ancestors had come from. Mm -hmm. They were living in a world where in courtrooms throughout the South, there was actually a black Bible and an altogether separate white Bible to swear to tell the truth on in court. That means that the same sacred object could not be touched by hands of different races. The very word of God was segregated in the Jim Crow South. And so that said to me that there was a tremendously, there was this huge investment in not just uh, this idea that they did not, that they felt hatred for another group, but mm -hmm. they had an investment in the degradation and subjugation of the group. They had an investment in keeping the boundaries fixed and in their view permanent in order to maintain the hierarchy that they created. And mm -hmm. so I, uh, in doing the research, came across the work of anthropologists who had studied the Jim Crow South in the depths of the Jim Crow South. And they mm -hmm. came out of their research using the word caste. Right. They used this ancient language that describes essentially this artificial, arbitrary, graded ranking of human va value mm -hmm. in which, and a society um, in which a person, an individual uh, was granted um, standing, respect, benefit of the doubt, mm -hmm. um, access to resources or, or lack thereof, right. uh, assumptions of competence, intelligence, beauty, on the basis of the category that they've been assigned to. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was essentially the caste system. And that was language that the anthropologists emerged out of uh, th those who had studied the Jim Crow South. Mm -hmm. And that is the term that I began to use in The Warmth of the Suns. So people who read The Warmth of the Suns uh, may, not, may not have realized, maybe I think if they're reading closely, they know that the word racism per se is not really in the book. Um, the word caste is a word that's in the book and people read through it and they begin to understand and absorb the meaning of that word as they experience with the people what they were going through, what they endured, what they suffered, and ultimately what they were escaping in the great migration. So that's how I came to the word. Right. Well, yeah, you think about Oliver Cox, you know, caste, class, and race. You think about some of the great sociological analyses, some of the anthropological studies. And, and the reason I say this is because the breadth of your erudition here, worn lightly but deeply inscribed in the text, uh, is a role model uh, for people who write about this stuff as scholars and who are trying to make more than five people understand what the hell they're talking about. So the way in which you translate that stuff, you dig deeply and it takes time and you take your time by going to different countries, by studying and, and interviewing different people and then using the kind of narrative impetus of a lived experience to articulate philosophical depths that are hard to understand when they're esoteric and abstract, but you make it real plain. As the old preachers say, you put it where the goats can get it, right? <laughs> where, the, where the folk can eat it, right? And, I, and I, I think that's extremely important because despite the elegance of its construction and the eloquence of the language, there is such power and such, you know, uh, not only rhetorical force, but philosophical depth to what you're saying. H having said that, so when you think about the fact that Look, Michael uh, Omi and Howard Wynett in their book, Racial Formation, talk about race as a social construct, right? right? And then they say there's a big difference between ethnicity and race, and people get them mixed up. Uh, if you're talking about a shared language and culture on the one hand, if you're talking about a kind of biologically determined existence that as you masterfully uh, deconstruct here is, is something that's artificial anyway, right? right? So when you think about all that, and then I think about um, Orlando Patterson in his book, Slavery and Social Death, where he does a comparative analysis. And he says, look, we're gonna look at these, what, 16 uh, slave societies, and we're gonna find out 
what makes the experience in our culture so different? Now, so I'm, 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 I'm bringing it down to what you do in your comparative analysis. You look at Nazi Germany, you look at India uh, with the untouchables and the caste system, the, reg, the rigid regimentation and restrictions, rules, uh, and some would say ruin of life under that oppressive society. And then you look at the caste system in America, the Southern apartheid, the homegrown yeah. terror that was introduced there. Now, some people be tripping. Oh my God, how can you dare compare what was going on here to what was going on in Nazi Germany and what was going on in India? And I defy anybody to read this tome and not understand the way in which you've weaved them together. But you know that's philosophically and even theoretically problematic to some people, if not even intellectually and ideologically. So explain to us the beauty and the power of bringing a comparative analysis of looking at caste through the lenses of three different societies, but that has core beliefs of dehumanization and stigmatization and the eight pillars you speak about that characterize what caste is. Well, uh, part of the, uh, one of the reasons why the idea of caste is so illuminating for us is because we are accustomed to seeing ourselves through certain language. And you can see yourself in a certain way. You can look at something for so long that you stop being able to see it. Mm -hmm. And this is a way of, of uh, learning from how other societies have been uh, formed and how they operate and seeing what we can learn about ourselves by seeing the points of intersection with those other societies. And so one of the societies, of course, that I was looking at most uh, particularly because I was using the word caste was, of course, the, the hierarchies in India, which mm. are ancient, thousands and thousands of years old, um, extremely um, regimented, regulated, uh, deep and, and uh, complicated uh, systems with four main varnas. And then there's the outcast of uh, what were formerly known as untouchables and now known as Dalits, which is uh, what I'm saying is an analog to uh, African-Americans in this country, descendants of enslavement in this country. And so that was one of the first places that I was looking, of course, to be able to see what were the points of intersection. And uh, one of the things that I found to be true across uh, these three systems, uh, India and, and, and the 12 year concentrated t uh, t uh, years of terror, uh, in, in Germany were the, this obsession with purity and pollution, purity of the dominant group mm -hmm. at all cost, separation, boundaries from uh, the need to the feel, the feeling or the impulse to protect the dominant group from intrusion by or contamination by those deemed as, sub as subordinate. So that, for example, in India, and each one had different ways of, of uh, of uh, enforcing it, different ways of metrics for how they were going to do it. But in India, for example, there was uh, a lower a lower caste person, subordinate subordinate caste person could have to be 96 paces away from the uh, upper caste or dominant caste person. That's one way that, that they interpreted it. Um, there were many different ways. Of course, in the United States, we have many different ways. But one of the things that was very similar among them all was this idea of water, the central life-giving element on our planet that had to at all costs be protected and controlled by the dominant caste. So that of course, uh, in, in India, uh, they could not, uh, Indian uh, who were, who were uh, uh, subordinate caste could not draw from the same well as the dominant caste people, of course could not drink from the same cup as a dominant caste person. Uh, in Nazi Germany, uh, there were restrictions that said that, Ju that Jewish citizens could not use the pools and the um, beaches, the waters in, uh, in, in Germany because it would be viewed as polluting. And then uh, in the United States, of course, we know that the race riot, what would end up being called a race riot of, of 1919 in Chicago had begun after a, uh, a black boy uh, in Chicago 
was swimming in Lake Michigan and he waded into what was called the white water. Now, how do you make the distinction between, how do you draw the line in water as to what is white and what is black? But here he was, he was swimming and he happened to wade into what was viewed as the white water and he was stoned to death for having done so. So the idea of water as that point of intersection of, of uh, protecting and policing and, and creating boundaries to the point of death, you know, in other words, it could be a matter of life and death if you breached this, these various pillars of caste. And so that was one of them. And I found that it was stunning to me that across time, across oceans, across continents, these three hierarchies, and these are just three out of many in the world, but these three hierarchies um, turned to and relied on the same um, metric, the same uh, mechanism of maintaining uh, power, maintaining difference, maintaining the boundaries to protect and preserve the purity of the dominant group. I found that to be one of the many stunning ways that they, there were intersections. Right. And the perversion of a spiritual intensity Absolutely. that was signified within water, cleansing, yes. baptism, cleansing. renewal, yes. and the perverse inversion of those meanings so that the imposition on bodies of both water and of human body, um, these perverted meanings shows the essential artifice of race as you constructed, of caste as you constructed here, yeah. uh, and, and so very powerfully. Um, and that's why to me, metaphor is so important, right? Uh, the comparative analysis that you do and the kind of analogical, uh, if you will, investigation, because you're making all these analogies uh, between what's going on. Like for instance, I loved, uh, how did you, you saw that, saw that, um, Rate that cast is the bone, yeah. right? The bones and race is the skin. And it got me to thinking, well, what's the blood? So if you <laughs> <laughs> if you're right, so if if race is if if cast is the bone and bones and and race is is the skin, then what is the the flow, the life-giving impetus of I thought ideology, right? The right. construction of racial mythology. And the way in which you kind of help us understand, you know, uh, in this book, how caste operates, because it's not just simply uh, the imposition of a an arbitrary physical distinction among peoples and a kind of anthropological, you know, assessment of them. It's also a kind of argument, a kind of mythological, almost mystical uh, yeah. assignment of worth or dehumanization to other people generated out of something that people just essentially made up. Yes. So help us understand why, even though it gets settled in bodies, caste systems, regimentation, and rigidity, that it is essentially uh, a metaphorical ideal, and it's a mystical, magical invention that is as arbitrary as anything we might imagine. Help us understand that. Well, one of the things that I, you know, make mention of is the fact that, you know, race, of course, is a social construct. Uh, we know that it's, it's a creation that, you know, color is a fact, but race is a social construct. Right. And there could be any number of metrics that could have been used and have been used to create hierarchy in any society. Mm -hmm. um, you know, religion, uh, ethnicity, uh, birthplace, geography, any number of things would be used. And in our case in America, it happened to be phenotype. It happened to be what you look like to create uh, a hierarchy. These are neutral characteristics. Uh, that people have. And, the, and, and in this case, you're taking these neutral characteristics and converting them into value as mm -hmm. to who should be positioned where in a hierarchy. Um, and as I said, any number of things could have been used. And in this case, they used uh, this, this arbitrary uh, description. And, and so when, I, when we say that race is the, uh, is the, the cast is the bones and race is the skin, we need to bring in that third uh, descriptor, which would be class. Mm -hmm. And class would be the uh, the diction and the bearing and the clothing, the things that we put on, uh, on top of ourselves, education in order to uh, help position ourselves differently, perhaps, than how we were presumed to be born, to, what we were presumed to be born to. And so that is why I say that, you know, that if you can act your way out of it, it's class. If you cannot act your way out of it, it's caste. And this is a reminder of the rigidity the enduring, you know, sadly, the enduring power of this, of this uh, creation of caste, 
which is it, which is in my description here, it is the infrastructure of all these other divisions. In other words, the impulse to control, the impulse to amass power and resources, the impulse to, to regulate another group and to keep them in a fixed place so that you as a dominant group can stay on top. That is what I'm describing as caste, the infrastructure of these divisions. And any number of things can be used uh, to, to uh, assert that. Gender, all kinds of other aspects of human identity can be used to control and to create a metric. But I wanted to say a little bit about the word caste because you use the word caste in a different term, and then you said, "Well, you know that that that's a, you know, it's interesting how word how the language can be used." But I want to call our attention to the idea that caste is something that is about boundaries and policing of the boundaries. What is the difference between this and and and, and racism as we know it? This is an obsession with policing boundaries. And that's one of the things that we have been seeing in these videos. So how is this resurgent now? How is it that we have made so much progress and that and you know in our current era you can have a per, two people at a Starbucks just waiting for a friend and someone calls the police on them. That you can have a family barbecuing in Oakland in a park, public park, and someone calls the police on them. How is it that a man, a marketing executive can be trying to you know, un unlock the door in his condo building lobby and a woman will block his path, follow him all the way to the elevator, follow him up the elevator, not afraid, not afraid, but follow him up the elevator onto this floor and to make sure that he actually belongs in that building, that he belongs in that building. So that's about the policing of boundaries. And that's about this, this autonomic recognition or impulse to control and to, to believe that people belong in a certain place and that they should be returned to and kept in that certain place. So you think about a cast on the arm. Mm -hmm. And you think about that mechanism that holds the fractured bones in place, that they will fuse and stay in place. That's one way that the word cast is used in our language. You think about the cast in a play in which there's a stage and there's a person stage left, stage right, foreground, background, and everybody knows where they're supposed to be in that play. And each person knows their lines. They know their lines. Mm -hmm. And if they're really invested in that, that play, they will know the entire script. They will know everybody's lines. And mm -hmm. if you make a change in that script and you move someone who's been the, in the background into the foreground, everybody has to figure out what does that mean for them? It can be viewed as threatening to have a change in the script when everyone has known what the script is. And so these are some of the metaphors, you know, I mentioned, you mentioned the metaphors in the book, but these are some of the metaphors that help us to, um, you know, to be able to think about how this works in our society. And I think it's quite interesting that the word caste cool. applies to all of these things about keeping people in a fixed place. Wow, Sunday night, she preaching over here. She giving you black preaching over here. <laughs> this is the homiletical, homiletical genius of blackness. This is the hermeneutical density of black textuality. That's what she up here doing. She preaching the word to you. She's that's pretty Haynes, my man. Uh, talking about cast and cast and cast and cast and how is you. And, and beautiful, you know, uh, <laughs> multi vocality of it, right? Uh, or as the philosophers say, multi evidential, whole bunch of stuff at the same time, and it counts as evidence in a, in a number of arenas and ways. But, but, and I love the autonomic system because then I think about the nervous system and then I think about, you know, yeah. how the stuff is spread, how the messages are communicated. But help us understand the following What purchase do you get philosophically and intellectually, and let's be honest, even culturally? by having a kind of terminological shift in the midst of one of the greatest epics of racial malaise in America to shift the term to caste. What do we gain? What do we lose? What are we afraid of, of losing the intimacy and familiarity terminologically of race versus caste? And does that, does that separate us from historic legacies of philosophical argument that we might appeal to in order to make uh, our claims, or do we lose something in the process, or do we gain something that a resource that we have uh, heretofore ignored that attaches us to, you know, to cultures around the world, Nazi Germany, uh, what happens in India, and God knows when you talk about it in your book as well, what happens in South Africa. Tell us what the fear of exactly. race to caste is. What do we get from it? What do we lose with it? 
Well, this is not to say that racism is not real. I mean, this is not to say, you know, race is not real. I mean, race right. is a social construct, but right. it has been made real because of the consequences that carry and attach to the meaning that's been uh, added to, uh, to this uh, 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 defining aspect of, of human uh, character categorization. Mm -hmm. This is to say that there's something, uh, something underneath what we think we see. That is, this is not to say that racism is not a factor in our lives. It's to say that there's something underneath it that's even um, more deeply embedded and even in some ways more powerful but because we do not see it, because we have not recognized it, because we have not named it, because mm -hmm. we do not see the ways that it operates. And so what it's saying is they actually work in tandem. They, re, they, they reinforce each other in ways that make each even more powerful. They make each more powerful. This is not to say that one exists without the other. It's saying that we have not been able to see it. We've not named it. We've not often seen the connection. This is part of the whole idea of American exceptionalism um, or any country's exceptionalism when you think about it, that we as human beings have far more in common with each other than we, than, than we often recognize. And that, uh, and that any country could in, in possibly have a lot that they could see points of connection with other countries in history than we might have otherwise uh, realized. And so this is to say that we can learn something from the way other countries have operated. We can see the connections between ourselves and them. And then we can maybe see how, um, how actually all these things are operating if we are to have any chance of really getting underneath them of really resolving them. Yeah, that's a hell of a point. And it's important because you tend to exist in a silo. You think that yeah. your oppression is world making and definitive. And in many ways it is, but it's not exhaustive. It may be specific, it may be particular, but it's not exhaustive in the sense that throughout the world, there are certainly hierarchies, there are dehumanizing impulses, but they take on specific manifestations in particular cultures and they manifest themselves with a kind of lethal intensity predicated upon what goes on on the local scene. But yeah. let me ask you this. So what one notices as an informal ethnographer uh, <laughs> scanning the globe, um, <laughs> that when I'm in Salvador de Bahia, when I'm in Santiago de Cuba, uh, when I look at what happens you know, across Europe, right? Certainly even in Africa, but let's, let's talk about these other places. We ain't got no racism. We are beyond this mythology and ideology. But the darker people get dissed. Yeah. The dehumanizing impulses are filtered through a kind of epidermal fetish. Yes. Or the way in which the skin becomes yeah. the resident authority uh, to invite in a kind of dehumanizing practice. So, so tell us about that. Explain that to us in, in terms of caste. Because all over the world, it seems that the darker you are, the worse you treat it. That goes with Latinx brothers and sisters, right? There's a difference if you are from Washington Heights and you are Black Dominican versus being a white Cuban from, yeah. from Miami, right? Or even within our own, the intramural eviscerations we practice among ourselves, right? Light, bright, and almost white versus brown and dark. And, and, and when yeah. you talk about if you can, if you can, if you can, how did you put it? If you can uh, explain your way out, buy your way out, uh, figure your way out, then it's class. Look at the class divisions even among black people. So two things, yeah. how do you look all over the world and see that the darker peoples of the world are dissed? And what does that say about class? And is that a unifying infrastructure, an undergirding reality that's at that level even more universal than race that unites us, that gets rid of that American exceptionalism? And what about class even within say black culture? Well, see how I would put it from a caste perspective is there's caste within caste. Mm -hmm. There's caste within caste. In other words, the, okay. the impulse to have hierarchy, to rank within even the, uh, say the subordinated caste mm -hmm. and the dominating caste, that there is the impulse to make distinctions even within caste. So there's subcaste within caste. Right. And one of the uh, examples of that, I mean, for the in the United States, for example, is what happens with those people who are in the middle caste. I mean, in the United States, the caste were essentially it was a bipolar caste system mm -hmm. in which you had the English colonists at the very top arriving uh, on these shores 
decimating the numbers of uh, indigenous people, driving them off the land, that's one. Uh, and, then, uh, and then extracting uh, Africans to the United States, what before there was the United States, to the colonies mm -hmm. and enslaving them. Uh, and, then, uh, and then that's creating the two tiered caste system right. with uh, the English uh, colonists on the top and African enslaved people on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And then what happens when people come in from outside of those two poles? Mm -hmm. So when people would come in, say, from other parts of Europe, from, from Southern and Eastern Europe, they arrived here and having to figure out, having to navigate how they're going to fit into what was in a bipolar system. And right. at, upon arrival, it determined, turned out that uh, the earliest ones, say the Germans and the, uh, and the Irish, actually did not have a choice. They arrived here as Germans and Irish, or they arrived here as Poles and Hungarians, and then were assigned to this new category that did not exist in Europe six or seven hundred years ago. It was a new category called white people. Right. And so that was the creation. That's where race comes in. Race is a, is, a, is a social construct, but it's also a new construct in human history. And so that's what happened. That's, that's where you have the gradations there. And then, uh, as you well know, and then of course, that the, as people were coming in from other parts of the world, they mm -hmm. became what also what would be considered the middle caste. So people have to figure out they do not fit the category of the so-called dominant caste, and they don't fit the category of enslaved Africans. And they have to figure out where do they fit in. And right. there's there is this race to be accepted by, approved by, and meet the standards set by the dominant caste, because the dominant caste is where the power resides. The dominant caste is where the resources re reside, set, the setting the terms of one's citizenship, citizenship. Yes. And so this is what was creating this, the, a ladder of hierarchy within this country. But the transatlantic slave trade and the colonization of, of, of the sub-Saharan sub Africa then set the terms of, an, of essentially the subjugation or the perceived subjugation of, of anyone from that part of, 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 our, of our planet. And mm -hmm. there you have um, this ranking that became global, one might say, on the basis of one, what one looks like. And the closer that one was to uh, the dominating uh, people, meaning the people who were uh, of European descent, not this is this was going back hundreds of years. It's not the creation of anyone alive today, but this is this is what we've inherited. This sets in uh, a kind of uh, you know caste within caste that became global, not just of one country. Right, and that's extremely important to talk about because there's a semiotic register, a kind of symbolic universe of signifying. Yeah, it goes on that no matter where you are across the world, the darker you are, you know, say the darker the berry, the sweeter the juice, the darker yeah. the berry, the more hesitant the truce. Yeah. The humanity of these people. All right, I'm just trying to, y'all work with me. I'm just trying to preach. I didn't get a chance to preach today. So, <laughs> but the thing is, the thing is, is that you have that kind of universal, universalizable hierarchy that yeah. is different. It's not like you go to some places where, oh, I see the darker people are upon the top and the lighter people are at the bottom, right? Um, so that, so that the, the, the exportation globally, the global exportation of darkness as demonization, as stigmatization is connected then to, I think your rather brilliant um, you know, argument about how caste operates and caste within a caste, within a caste, within a caste, within a caste, right? We know it, right? How many castes you got? How many castes you want? <laughs> so, you, so you generate it. Because it's the utilitarian ethic of a caste system rests upon the intent of the colonizer, the, the dominant figure, as well as the subordination of those that we can coerce into a rather submissive position. And I yeah. think that within cultures themselves, we see the same thing operating, the bullies over those that, you know, the, the people who can bully those uh, who are beneath them so that there's a kind of totemic force to that dominance uh, that you express there in, uh, in terms of caste. So talk to us too, you know, I was thinking about um, when, when Orlando Patterson in his book, Slavery and Social Death, speaks about, you know, black people in these comparative uh, slave societies, that in this North American version, that when Christianity got involved, it got real funky, right? When you bring God yeah. in, you know, like uh, the Lord uh, told us uh, to rescue <laughs> you uh, savages from your interminable, uh, if you will, uh, engagement with inferiority to be brought here, right? 
to, to be made superior. So you got all this evangelical Christianity, the piety and uh, of religious traditions brought to bear to reinforce the subordination of people, right? So when religion gets involved, it's real funky. But he talks about black people being genealogical isolates and then we're experiencing social death, right? So that's within the context of a racialized dominance of white over black. When you have a notion of caste, it's not that you get rid of those, as you said, it's not that race disappears, but you have an overarching no. and an undergirding explanatory power that helps us understand what's at stake here. Now, let, let, me, let me put this forth and you respond to it. So one of the things is it might be more accessible for white people and others trying to grapple with this, not to feel personally uh, pointed to, so to speak, singled out, even though we know white supremacy is deep and profound and in both caste and in race, but is it also a kind of clever rhetorical and ideological, but especially terminological manipulation that allows the heat to be taken off of a term race? Oh, no, I'm not a racist. Yes, I am. I'm a racist. No, I'm a racist. Yeah, you're a racist. No, we're all racist. No, we're not. We got that <laughs> argument out the way. Caste is a more, quote, neutral argument that allows people who have been benefited from it advantaged by it and also victimizing in it to be able to take a less heated approach to analyzing the issue of difference in that, in that context. You, you know, I'm, I'm saying that I think your cast might do that. <laughs> well, um, if, what do you do if people, before you can even begin talking, say they're not something? Right. If they have in their own, um, their own imagination mm -hmm. decided to redefine language right. in a way that makes people feel better about themselves mm -hmm. and have essentially made verboten uh, language that we have come to be uh, to use. Right. I mean, what, what do you do? If, or you can even say anything, someone says, no, I'm not, right. you are. Right, right, exactly. And the P we so uh, that means- are, but What am I? <laughs> Right. Yeah. right. So um, it means having to be um, nimble and uh, and I think uh, flexible uh, and wise in making use of an entire universe of language to communicate what needs to be communicated. Right. Right. Oh, that's brilliantly said. That's beautifully said avoiding all of the uh, unnecessary vitriol that might be occasioned by saying it more plainly. <laughs> White folk be thinking they're racist because you call them a racist if, to begin with, you ain't got no damn conversation. So slow down with that. Let's invent some new terms that are really old and then get purchased on a whole universe of thought that we have ourselves neglected because we bought into the very exceptionalism that we claim we oppose. Brilliantly done, Professor uh, Wilkerson. Uh, brilliantly and done. And well said yourself. <laughs> <laughs> we might have to go on the road. My God. <laughs> so when I think about um, these comparative analyses, and you talk about, I know look, look, people reading your book would be tripped out. What? Wait a minute. Are you telling me the German folk? I mean, I noticed the uh, input, you know, the insertion of verboten. Very nicely done. Uh, <laughs> So <laughs> that's a spam button. So, so, so when you got, when you got the fact that, you know, uh, you got people in this book, say, wait, wait a minute, the, 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 the Aryan people, the, 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 the religious, the religious, you know, right wing, the racist people came to apartheid South from Germany to study what was going on here so they could figure out what they would do in Nazi Germany. That gives pause to those who would in a knee jerk kind of way go, how dare you make a comparison because there's nothing, you know, uh, to be compared to the uniqueness, which the, the evil, and you're not doing this. Uh, the late great Christian, uh, Barbara Christian uh, said, we don't want to engage in an oppression derby. <laughs> My stuff was worse than yours. No, 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 mine was worse. No, 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 I was worse. But when your oppression happens in the 20th century where you have pictures, it's different than when it happened in the 17th, 18th century where you got doggera types. Frederick Douglass may have been the most photographed and, and pictured person in the 19th century, but you ain't got no films. You ain't got no. You ain't got no video camera about what was going on. You ain't got no George Floyd like, you know, uh, capture of what was happening. So tell us about, you know, the study 
of American apartheid as an inspiration for the caste and racial hierarchy and, and, the, and the dominance over the subordinate and the purity. I think about Mary uh, Douglas, purity and danger, that anthropological brilliance. Tell us about that. That might surprise a lot of people. Well, okay, so first I have to preface it by saying that I ended up looking at Germany only because um, you know, after Charlottesville, I mean, and there in Charlottesville, the protesters themselves made the connection. They made the connection for the country and for the world. There in the sim symbology, they had in their regalia, the symbols of Confederacy and of the Nazis there before our eyes. And after that, um, you know, realizing that that, that, that episode, that situation was a reminder that, you know, that our history, we are not on the same page about basic facts of our of American history. We're not. And it, it reminded us that this really was about memory, first knowledge of the history and then memory of that history. Mm -hmm. And so that made me, uh, you know, that drew me to, uh, to Germany to see how is it, how was it that they were dealing with their history and the memory of that history? How were they reckoning with it, atoning for it? How are they dealing with it? And uh, that's where I, that's why I went to begin with. And then the more I looked into the history of Nazi Germany, I came to discover that it turned out that German eugenicists were in dialogue with and consulting with American eugenicists in the 1920s and uh, 1930s leading up to the, uh, their, the uh, Third Reich, um, that actually they, that the, that the Nazis admired the 1924 immigration uh, law that restricted immigration uh, to the United States on the basis of, of eugenicist beliefs, that uh, American eugenicists were writing books that were big sellers in Germany and very popular among the Nazis. In fact, the Nazis adopted some of them for their curricula. I mean, this was just stunning to me. Now, of course, we know that the Nazis needed no one to teach them how to hate. They did not need anyone to teach them how to hate, but they actually sent researchers and studied as researchers to the United States and studied the Jim Crow laws, the laws against miscegenation, anti-miscegenation laws, uh, prohibiting marriage across racial lines. They studied the segregation laws that, again, the purity and pollution keeping uh, African-Americans from uh, separate from and apart from and below uh, white Americans and particularly in the South. They studied these laws. They studied the, the American definition of race, the American definition that in, that in many states meant a single drop of blood made a person black. So they looked at all these things and they examined these laws and they debated these laws as they were constructing what would ultimately become the Nuremberg laws. This was just wrenching to discover, just wrenching, wrenching to, to realize. And, um, you know, th these are the kinds of things that, um, you know, that are a reminder of the of these connections that a lot of people we, we would not have normally known. And I want to, you know, make sure that I, there are many, many people who do research on this, many, many people who have done research and who have done the uh, translations of these things. And I want to um, be sure to mention uh, James Q. Whitman from Yale, who did a tremendous, tremendous uh, uh, research into this area. Um, so many people have done research in this area. And it was just wrenching to discover that these were aspects of interconnectedness between these two cultures. And I should also emphasize that the, sub, the subtitle of this book is The Origins of Our Discontents. The right. Origins of Our Discontents. So this is to emphasize that these were the early years of the Reich, the very early years of the Reich. And we know that it, toward the end of the war, later uh, in their reign, and their uh, reign of terror, they did the unthinkable. In, in, in murdering six million uh, Jews be, far beyond anything that, 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 that any uh, uh, person with, with any, of any conscience could even begin to imagine. So this is an emphasis on the origins right. of these hierarchies in each of these places, the origins right. of them. Right, exactly. Man, they're, they're giving us the hook over here. We get the Sandman hook because we're at the Apollo and they're trying to pull us off stage. But before <laughs> we go, all right, I know we, we, we're not gonna get to the questions. God bless them. Uh, uh, you, you'll be able to answer. We'll send them to you individually. And maybe you can reach out. Uh, but let me end by saying this. What's your process? What's your process of writing? You are one of the greatest writers this nation has ever seen. And I'm willing to stand by that with these two wonderful books. Do you be out here like collecting some notes on a note card, reading the stuff, then assembling it, 
and then organizing it? Do you have an outline? Tell us what you do. Because there are a lot of writers on there going, how in the world is she able to talk about atmospheric environmentalism and then put that into, you know, uh, quoting LeBron James, speaking about the fact, I don't care how rich you are, you're still African-American at the end of the day. She ends one of her chapters with King James. That's how relevant she is. So when you go watch the game tonight, think about Isabel Wilkerson. All right. So tell us what your process <laughs> is and, and the win. Don't forget the, ma the Matrix. Hmm? Don't forget the Matrix. Don't forget the Matrix? The Matrix, too. That's right. That's right. You got <laughs> The Matrix, the movie. You got the look, look, look. Yeah. <laughs> your range of pop culture is crazy, right? Your range of pop culture is crazy. So tell us about your writing uh, <laughs> style, your writing skills, your writing methodologies, and how you put all this stuff together. Well, first of all, I'm always uh, listening for and aware of inspiration wherever it may be. I mean, I'm constantly on alert for where uh, some um, moment or uh, fragment of, of uh, something in the news, something I might read, something I might hear, uh, whatever, and, and, and ideas. I mean, I'm constantly making notes at all times about things as they occur to me. I'm constantly engaging with whatever is around me, my, uh, my environment, wherever I happen to be. So I'm constantly, I'm always taking notes. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a congenital note taker, constantly taking notes. It's, I never even know where it's gonna lead. And so a lot of the, the ideas that I might have uh, come from those notes that I gather uh, along the way, string we might say in journalism. So that's one thing. I, I end up uh, doing as, as much, uh, uh, you know, research as I possibly can. I over-research, I'm constantly looking. Um, I love the footnotes of other people's books. I just, I love the footnotes. I love the end notes. I, I get very excited by the idea of, of going down these rabbit holes, wherever it may be, whether it's, whether it's on the internet, you know, the rabbit holes that you can go in, go to. I mean, the, just to get to the matrix was a lo very long uh, rabbit hole that I ended up writing up because I wanted to remember, how did I start with that? Like, how did I get to the right, right. matrix? <laughs> so, so I'm I'm constantly on alert for points of of uh, inspiration, and I never know where they're going to come from. So it's in a way it's like, um, it's in a way it's like you're cooking and you're making um, this stew, and you have to have the ingredients for the stew, and you don't know what is going to end up being in the stew, and you kind of go out and you you know you may go into a garden and you see what's in season, you see what's what's sprouting, you see what's in bloom, you see what's in flower, and you pull that, and you don't even know what you whether you'll use it or not. You don't know if it will make it in the stew or not, but you're gathering all that up. You're gathering all that up, and the end it's like it's like fragments of fabric for a quilt, and you're gathering all of these things up, and then you hope that in the end it will come to, to be something. And so then I create, uh, that's what I'm doing. Everything is a, is a fragment of fabric for the, the quilt. And then I stitch together the quilt and I don't have an outline. I keep trying to have an outline. I have a general idea of where it's gonna go, but a lot of it is very intuitive going with the flow. And I kind of pull those, put those pieces of the quilt together. Um, and I hope that it will end up being something that other people will uh, and um, want to to look at and explore and embrace after I'm done. All right, that's Isabel Wilkerson. Uh, you need to read this book. The book is entitled "Cast: The Origins of Our Discontents," from the Pulitzer Prize winner and uh, the National Humanities Medal, uh, New York Times bestseller, Oprah. Then interviewed her for the, you know, for her, for her show. So what else can you do? What else can you say? It's been our honor uh, to chat a bit here tonight uh, with this magnificent author and remarkable intellectual and great writer. God bless you, uh, Ms. Wilkerson, and thanks so much for writing this book. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't know if uh, now if they go give us some more time. It's the most type of stuff we can do, but I don't. I don't know if Miss Koch is on here or how we're supposed to end. I don't know how this is supposed to go. I don't know if uh, in the cast <laughs> of characters <laughs> that somebody will come on and tell us we got to <laughs> Otherwise, we can keep going. I mean, I just thought we were supposed to end at 8.50. But uh, if they ain't giving us the hook and we ain't got to stop, uh, I think we do. They just gave me the, yeah, shut up. Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
thank you so much again. Such an honor to speak to you. I have been doing <laughs> <laughs> This has been great. Y'all take good care now. Go watch LeBron James with new thank eyes. You. Go watch LeBron James exactly. with new eyes. <laughs> because of <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>